Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for toiling through the rain uh, to get here. Um, so today we're carrying on with our Dretschke on representation. On, um, in two days' time, uh, on Wednesday, what day is today? Two day days. Wednesday, on Wednesday, thank you, um, we'll, um, I'm sorry, yes, it's early in the week. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll go on to Fodor, uh, Fodor's paper in the reader. Um, Fodor's paper is a little bit unusual among the papers in the reader. Uh, most of the papers in the reader are really the simplest, clearest explanations of the view you could have. Um, Fodor's, uh, I mean, they may strike you as complex the first time you read them, but once you get the idea, when you go back and read them again, you see it, I hope, it really couldn't have been put much more clearly. Um, Fodor's paper is a little bit unusual. It, it's a very important idea in that paper, but it's put with great complexity. And, um, uh, well, I don't know, it's your call as to what you do. Um, uh, I, I just warn you, uh, it's, the, it's, it's the one exception to the, it's, it's a standout among the papers in the reader. Okay, so the general uh, question we're looking at is, What's the source of the existence of standards of truth and falsity for representations? How does it come about that in the world as described by physics, such a thing can be happening at all, that you have standards of truth and falsity? And all the um, arguments of the first few weeks has been that it's something to do with causal connections between the representational system and the world. But the puzzling thing about that is lots of things stand in causal connections to other aspects of the world without being representational. So it can't be just causation of itself that is generating the existence of standards of truth and falsity. Something else must be going on. The mere existence of causal connections can't constitute the existence of standards of right and wrong. And it's just that problem that when Dretschke talks about function, he seems to be intending to address. So there are two key notions in Dretschke's theory. The idea of X indicating Y, and the idea of it being the function of something to indicate Y. So just to pause, it indicates is where all the causal stuff goes. Indicates is where we pack in all the kind of causal chains. Um, the general definition is something like uh, R indicates C if means something like if there's an R, then C. And maybe typically that will be because C's cause R's. So if you say uh, smoke indicates fire, that means if there's smoke, then there's fire. And typically that will be because fire causes smoke. Yes? And that's obviously quite a general uh, uh, idea. Um, Notice, incidentally, that uh, if you just stick with this notion of indication, you, can't have, you, can't, you, you don't have anything that lets you make sense of informative identities. What I mean is, um, if C and D are the same thing, and if R indicates um, uh, C, then R indicates D. So if, if you've got something that indicates the presence of water, and water is H2O, then that thing indicates the presence of H2O. If you've got something that indicates the presence of Hesperus, Hesperus, and Hesperus is Phosphorus, then that thing indicates the presence of Phosphorus. You see what I mean? And I mean, really, in the background here, is, 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 the point is it's like that with causation, that um, if X causes Y and X is identical to Z, then Z causes Y. Is that plain enough, or do, should, should I give more examples? So there's something about meaning that is missing here from this talk about indication. Because we want something that is more fine-grained than this. Yeah? And this is where well, one thing that the notion of function, the place where the notion of function comes in. The notion of function does quite a lot of different things in Dretzky's picture. One thing it does is um, it lets you separate the case where um, C might be identical to D, but the function of a meter might be to indicate C rather than to indicate D. 
Yeah, you've got something that indicates the presence of water. You, the, the designer of the thing might have had no idea that water is H2O. So it's not the function of the thing to indicate the presence of H2O, even though water is H2O. Again, stop me if that's too fast or abstract. Is that, is that okay? Function, yep. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that if we're giving a, an account of representation, we want to know what the difference is between representing something as, let's say, water and representing it as H2O. Yeah, they should be different things. Yes? Um, but if you just say if, you say, if your only notion of representation was indication, then you couldn't make that distinction. Because if something's indicating the presence of water, then it's indicating the presence of H2O. That's a problem, right? Is that a problem? Put your hand up if you think that's a problem. Very good. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Put your hand up if you'd like me to go over that one more time. I see. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, that's the defini definition of indicates there, right? So we want to be able to say... Uh, Let's say the sign water. We want to be able to say the sign water has a particular kind of meaning, a particular kind of representational status. Yes? Okay. So I suppose I'm good at whether there's water there. And whenever I see water, I cry, water! Right? So now you can tell whether there's water there by just listening to my reactions. Yes? If I say water, that will indicate the presence of water. Yes? Okay? Are you all with me so far? Yes, I know it's early. Okay, you know, okay. So if I say water, that's going to indicate the present indicates uh, water. Okay. Um, so you could say, well, that's what the meaning of the word water is. It indicates the presence of word water. Presence of water. I mean, yes. Okay. Um, but if I'm in, if I am a good indicator of the presence of water, am I also a good indicator of the presence of H two O? Yes, I can't but be, because whenever there's water, there's H2O. Yeah? So if I say water, that's also a good indicator of the presence of H2O. But we want to separate these things and say water has a tie to, uh, the word water has a tie to um, this stuff thought of as water and not to this stuff thought of as H2O. You see what I mean? Water and H2O are represent water is representing the substance in one way, H2O is representing the substance in another way. Was that too fast? Water and H2O mean different things. Yes? But so far we haven't captured any difference between them. Because the word water is indicating water and H2O. Yes? Yes, that's right, H2O indicates water. Yeah. So if I cry H2O, that will indicate the presence of water, and that will indicate the presence of H2O. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that fills out the picture, right? So I've got no difference in what water indicates and what H2O indicates. Sorry? Then they have the same meaning, yeah. If our only notion of meaning is indication, then water and H2O have the same meaning. But class, do water and H2O have the same meaning? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they do not have the same meaning. So must there be more to meaning than the notion of indication? Yeah. Yes, thank you. There must be more to meaning, uh, meaning than the notion of indication. OK, what supplies that little bit more? What supplies that little bit more? <laughs> yes, very good, okay. <laughs> okay. Is that clear what the problem is and what the solution is? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, um, if we can appeal to the idea that, well, what, what, my, my, sorry, my intention, my, the function I assign to the word water is to indicate the presence of water, then I might have that intention without ever having heard of H2O. Yes? 
And similarly, I might be thinking about H2O, but never have thought of it as thought of this stuff as water. I might have be a chemist who's approached water H2O purely as a kind of theoretical construct. Okay, so that will get me the difference between the two. But that's talking about an assigned function, what I intend the thing to do. Um, but Dretzky's idea is you could have functions observed in the context of evolutionary theory, the uh, role that a particular um, structure is serving in the life of an animal, uh, how it fills the animal's needs. That might generate standards of rightness and wrongness too. So we do have a general notion of function for biological organs. Um, and uh, maybe we can apply that to the structures that we have in the brain. And that will explain how standards of right and wrong are being generated. So um, two things are happening here. One is um, when you bring in function, you're bringing in something that's more fine grained than the talk of indication. That's one thing. When you bring in function, you're also bringing in something normative. You're bringing in something that has to do with getting it right or getting it wrong. Because something can be well functioning or badly functioning. You're bringing in something evaluative when you bring in function. And you're also bringing, narrowing down which, indicate, which indicators are relevant to representation. Because if you take any one thing, any one thing can, can indicate lots and lots of different things. I mean, someone gave the example last time of the level of chicken feed indicating how well the chickens are, how well fed the chickens currently are. That could be a good indicator of that, but it's not its function to indicate that. So any one thing has got lots and lots of other stuff causally connected to it, um, but, um, and so can serve as an indicator of all our other stuff, but it's not thereby representing all our other stuff, because its function is perhaps not to represent all our other stuff. Yeah, nothing gave it that function. Not someone's intentions, not evolution. Yep. So there's quite a lot going on when function is brought in here. But there is a general question here. If we're talking about causal connections between the representational system in the world, well, when you ask what is causally connected, if X and Y are causally connected, then X and Y must both exist, right? It's only the way the world actually is that um, can be causally impacting on our representational systems. And in a way, that's really Putnam's point about the brains in the vat. It's the way the world actually is that is causally affecting your representational system. It's the way that whatever is actually going on out there, whether it's vat tending machinery or the world the way you think it is or something else, whatever is actually happening, that's what's causally impacting on your representational system. So Putnam used this as a defense against the skeptic. But there's obviously a puzzle here. Namely, if what's actually affecting you is, what you're co is, is uh, what's making the existence of standards of right and wrong, then how can you ever get it wrong? I mean, something imaginary, something that you were wrong about, couldn't be causally impacting on you. So there's a general question here, how such a thing as error is possible. Okay, so that's, I think, where we got to, more or less, last time. Is that clear about all the different stuff that function is bringing in? Okay. Um, so just, uh, you remember the old, the, the magnetosomes, the magnetosomes that allow the bacterium to move to, uh, towards the magnetic north into um, deeper water. Yeah. Here are two marine biologists um, hunting for magnetosomes in, I think, uh, Norway. Um, don't say you don't learn anything in this class. Um, and here is the magnetosome uh, pointing towards uh, magnetic north. So we say that thing is serving a need of the organism. Its function is to indicate the direction of the oxygen-free water. So that if it gets into, um, uh, if it points towards water that is not oxygen-free, then it's made a mistake. 
That's, how, that's the simplest case of something making a mistake, getting it wrong. And Dretzky's definition was the magnetosomes pointing uh, straight ahead means that oxygen-free water is straight ahead. Uh, the magnetosome's function is to indicate the direction of the oxygen-free water. And it does this in part by indicating that the oxygen-free water is straight ahead by itself pointing straight ahead. So putting it like that, you're appealing to the idea that the magnetosome has the function of indicating the direction of oxygen-free water. Could, could you just think a bit more slowly, please? <laughs> no, I just, I, I want to come on to that in just a second. Oh. Yeah. Um, um, so, um, if you lure the uh, uh, bacteria into oxygenated water by holding a magnet, then I say, though you might not, that, uh, then I say they misrepresented something. You fooled them. Yes? That's very intuitive. That's what I'd say. I'd say, ha 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 I fooled you. <laughs> Another victory for the human over the animal mind. Um, right? Um, but um, can you make your point again? Right, if his function is to point towards magnetic north. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you don't mean, you, you mean local magnetic north. Right, we can distinguish the north pole, the, I mean, the geomagnetic north, right? When I put the magnet there, it didn't point towards geomagnetic north, it pointed towards local magnetic north. Right. Yep. Um, so, um, You could say, when we use the bar magnet, the magnetosome correctly represents the direction of local magnetic north. So I'm slowly catching up, OK? <laughs> right. um, and then you might say, look, the, the uh, magnetosome represented local magnetic north perfectly correctly. Yeah? That's its function, to point out local magnetic north. Um, what goes on in, the, in, in that case is that it represents local magnetic north perfectly correctly. Um, it usually exploits a connection between local magnetic north and the direction of the oxygen-free water. Um, um, and that thing it exploits just didn't happen to hold in this case. But at no point did it misrepresent anything. Yeah? So it's hard to say what the function is of the magnetosome. You could say... Um, You could say its function is to represent um, local magnetic north. You could say, actually, its function is to represent geomagnetic north. Its function is to represent the direction of the North Pole. Or you could say its function is to represent the, um, to indicate the uh, direction of, of local magnetic north. Or, sorry, of, of the oxygen, deoxygenated water. Um, and it's not very clear how you determine which function that is, which function it's serving. And you know what the need is? It needs oxygen-free water. It doesn't really care about local magnetic north or geomagnetic north for their own sex. But um, that doesn't help us say, determine whether the function is one rather than the other of these. The function has become its need. Well, it only, the, the, the systems the animal has only have functions in relation to the animal's needs. Yeah, that's perfectly clear. Yeah, we're all on board with that. Um, but um, to say that is just to say the functions have to be defined in relation to the animal's needs. So it's always going to be possible for us to say, look, is meeting that need of the animal by giving it information 
they can use to meet that need. Yeah. And local magnetic north or geomagnetic north will equally allow the animal to meet that need. Get you pointing it in the right direction because then it just uses the correlation here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you see the problem here, which is um, this is quite this is quite general. Um, whenever you've got a system that is causally sensitive to something in the outside environment, um, you can say, well, uh, uh, suppose. Um, Suppose there's some ex uh, distal um, property of the animal that the sensor, the sensor is causally sensitive to. And suppose there are actually two different factors that can um, cause that sensor to activate. That's what you need for the case of error, right? Two different kind of factors. Then you can say, um, well, the animal's representing either of these yeah, it's just that when you get one or the other of these, you usually have this one. It's usually this one. And the animal just exploits that. Um, or with the um, oxygen-free water, the picture is you get oxygen-free water that's usually correlated with a geomagnetic north, that's usually correlated with local magnetic north, um, and uh, you can't tell which of these to say the, 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 the animal system is um, functioning to indicate. Uh, and you can always set this up. There's going to be some need at the end, some need uh, being met, so something that meets your needs, uh, your need meter down here, um, then something that indicates where, the, then something that's causally related to the need meter something that's causally related to that. What do you say the function of the system is? To indicate. Yeah? So when we were talking about um, Evans and causal theories of reference, I said, well, if I'm talking about that cup, um, I'm causally responding to the cup, but I'm also causally responding to stuff like the lights in the room, the sunshine outside, the, the illuminant that lets me see the cup. So you're, when you're causally referring to something, when you're referring to something in virtue of a causal connection to it, there are lots of stuff uh, that, you're, that are causally affecting you that you're not referring to. So you have problems about things like um, these other factors, like the sun, or uh, uh, the ambient temperature um, that are allowing you to have this causal sensitivity to, um, to these factors here. And you've got to factor them out. You've got these uh, kind of horizontal problems in um, saying uh, which thing you're representing. But you've also got v these vertical problems about saying how far away in the causal chain is the thing that you're representing? And the danger is, if you let it get too proximal, um, then you get the result that you can never be wrong. Anytime you re you go in, your indicator goes into a particular state, you can say, well, here's the factor that caused it to go into that state, and that's actually what it's representing. So your indicator never gets things wrong. And this is really just pushing Putnam's point absolutely to the limit. At the limit here, it turns out you're not representing at all, because you can have representation only if there's right or wrong, but here there's no wrong. Anything you're causally sensitive to turns out to be something that you were indicating. I'm not sure if I put that very well, but yes. So, um, the reason that function is brought in is because yeah. we have this puzzle about water, and, and we want to say that the representation is 
Uh, that's one reason function comes in, yes, to get the difference between what I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, if it did have that implication, that would be the wrong answer. Yeah, that would be a real problem for a causal theory if it said they just got the same meaning. Because after all, it is an informative identity. Yeah, that's where we began. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the function isn't ju coming in just because of that. The function is also coming in to explain how the standards of rightness and wrongness are being generated, how something evaluative is being generated here, and um, is also coming in to narrow down which causal pathways are the relevant ones. And this point is, um, it doesn't narrow them down enough. Okay, um, I, th I think this terminology comes from Peter Godfrey Smith. The, the, the idea is, um, well, if I say uh, I'm referring to whatever's causing me to use the indicator system, yeah, um, then um, as I speak about the cup, the cup is causally impacting on me, um, but the illumination is also impacting on me. The, te the temperature is not too hot and not too cold. That's uh, causally effective in allowing me to make these references. But I'm not referring to the sun. I'm not referring to anything but the cup, even though these other factors are all influenced me. So there's some sense in which all these factors are in play simultaneously, um, horizontally, if you see what I mean. Um, um, the, the, sun's, the, the illumination and the temperature aren't further away from me or closer to me than the cup. Yeah. Um, so there's a problem of filtering out all the irrelevant causes here and saying which of the causes is the one that I'm talking about. The other dimension is when I say um, I'm, uh, I'm causally affected by the cup, well, another, you, you might say, no, it's not the cup you're causally affected by. It's a pattern of hits on your retina. Um, you're really uh, causally sensitive to the pattern of hits in your retina, and you use the fact that that is correlated with a cup out there. Yeah, that's what I'm really referring to, the pattern of hits in the retina. So if someone says, um, if, if, if I have a hallucination of a cup, so I have the pattern of hits in my retina, but I don't get the cup out there, then that's not a mistake. I was just referring to the pattern of hits in my retina. Yeah. There was such a thing there. That's the analog of this thing about geomagnetic north and local magnetic north. Okay, so, yeah. so the vertical problem is something that's to do with the problem. Um, well, what I'm calling the vertical one has to do with um, the chain from the thing you're talking about to you okay. and asking at which point in that do you stop off Whereas the other one is um, a whole bunch of things that aren't at all the one you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, they're not in that path from the one you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so Dretzky's got a solution to this, um, which is to say, well, the puzzle is, what is the magnetosome representing? Is it the direction of the oxygen-free water? Is it geomagnetic north? Is it local magnetic north? I mean, I'm just curious, what do you think? Can you put your hand up if your intuition is it's representing direction of oxygen-free water? Geomagnetic north? Local magnetic north? Okay, so there's a, I would say the majority think, think that um, we fooled the magnetosome, but there's a substantial minority that say, uh, no, the magnetosome is innocent. Um, the magnetosome got everything right. Okay, um, well, it's hard to do that. It's hard to settle up by intuition. I mean, I don't really see that you can do it by direct intuition. Dreske's idea is, well, suppose we start out by saying, by supposing it's got two different ways of finding out the direction of oxygen-free water. So maybe it uses light as well as uh, uh, magnetism to, 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 to find the direction of the oxygen-free water. So if it's got the magnetosome and it's got a light detector, 
and it's got some structure um, S, uh, then um, if we've got the light and we've got the uh, magnetic field as both firing S, then um, uh, that means that you can't identify S as having it as its function to indicate either the uh, magnetic, di the, the, the geomagnetic or local magnetic north, or having as its function to pick up on the light. It must have something further out as its function. Yep. You couldn't identify it with either one. So um, the trouble with that is if you're really going to be difficult about this, then you could say, well, actually all that's going on there is that S is indicating either the direction of local magnetic north or the direction of light. Right? That would be the, the, the natural way to pursue the original problem. Um, so then Dreschke says, well, what we need here is associative learning. If you've got repeated exposures to X in the presence of oxygen-free water, then um, S will start to fire in response to X. If you've got that open-ended possibility of associative learning, you can't tie this down. You can't tie the structure down to representing any one or any finite number of these pathways because it can always open up to another one. And that's very intuitive because there's, there's something about you. You want the, the representation to be, a re, to, to be something that reasonably, uh, a reasonably sophisticated organism does. And it's kind of surprising if um, a, a bacterium with a magnetosome is already representing. Um, the ability to learn about your environment should have something to do with your ability to represent the environment. And this is a very intuitive um, way in that the possibility of associative learning about some distal structure in your environment, that's what makes it representation of that factor out there. Yeah. So at any one time, you could say, all I've got here is something that responds to either this local factor or that local factor or that local factor or that local factor. But the only thing that's stable over time as the organism keeps learning is that all these pathways are coming from that one same external factor out there in the distance. So if you're capable of learning any number of new ways of detecting Fness, then you are determinately representing F rather than anything else. So that's the solution to the, that's Dretzky's solution to the local magnetic north problem. It's a real problem. Yep. So, that's right, F would be the presence of oxygen free water. So the presence of oxygen free water is connected to all these other factors. It's a slightly difficult example because um, it's not so clear you can learn about the, about the oxygen free water because presumably if these bacteria get into the oxygen free water, um, <laughs> they just die. They, they, they don't learn anything. But um, if you think of it as rather being something like the direction of food, yeah, then what you need, what you would have is multiple pathways to getting you to food, and then you learn which ones, are, wh wh which pathways um, really are giving you ways of finding the direction of food uh, associatively. And you can just learn by whether you get the food or not. It doesn't kill you if you don't get it. Very good. Yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, that would be another way to do it. Yeah. You, you could say it's not learning. Dretschke, I think, is just talking about learning in the part of the individual organism. But you could talk about adaptation over time as a kind of learning. Yeah. Adaptation of the species over time. Okay. Um, I think. That's about as far as Dretschke gets in the article. Um, and I, I think this is uh, uh, pretty powerful. There are a number of problems with this. Um, one is, it's just becoming clear to me in the course of this, cl this class, actually, that uh, color is a very difficult case for causal theories of representation.
I suppose you um, think about uh, how you represent things as red or blue or yellow and so on. Do you have any other way of finding out about the color of an object than looking to see? I mean, it's all very well to say for um, food or oxygen-free water, there are lots and lots of different ways you can get onto that. But for color, um, the only way you have of finding out about the colors of things is looking. Vision is your only way of finding out about color. But we don't seem to be, I mean, intuitively, Gretzky's problem doesn't arise there. There's no, uh, it's not at all intuitive that we'd say our visual system is only representing what's going on at the retina or only representing what's going on in the light array. No, your visual system is representing something about the object, the color of the object. Um, but that can't, but if that's determinate, it can't be explained in this way by uh, the possibility of associative learning. We don't have any associative learning here. We only have our one canonical way of finding out about color. Someone who can't do it by vision can't do it at all. Yep. Oh, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the, okay, but the, the individual is not um, asso capable of associative learning. And the thing is, it's not whether there's learning here about color in the first place. It's multiple pathways. Yeah. The key to Dretzky's idea is multiple pathways all homing back to the same factor out there. But there aren't multiple pathways from color to us. Yes, right. <laughs> I take it this is not in humans. Yeah. Sorry? You can hear color? Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. I agree. Look, yeah. Okay. If you've got, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. If you've got um, this kind of structure, yeah, with multiple associatively learned pathways to your external factor, yeah, then any one of them can be dropped. No one of them is canonical. Yeah. Now your kind of situation is perfectly imaginable. It might be. I mean, you could have someone with very sensitive fingers who could just run the fingers over the surfaces of things and tell what colors they are. But if you dropped vision altogether, then what you'd have would be a system that didn't know anything about color. These um, other ways of finding out about color are really only guides to what you'll be find when you use the canonical way of finding out about color. You, you see what I mean? Namely, looking to see. And if you have that, and if you only have the canonical way of looking to see, and you don't have the ability to use these other methods, your brain hasn't been rewired, you don't actually have that capacity, you don't have these sensitive fingers, then um, you still are perfectly determinately representing the color of the object out there. Yeah. That, that's, that's the idea, anyhow. I think it would only be a guide to the presence of the color you could see. Yeah. Yeah. It, that, it needs a lot of discussion. This, if you think about shape, then uh, vision and um, touch are equally good ways of finding out about shape. Yeah. But vision and hearing, or vision and touch, are never going to be equally good ways of finding out about color. Vision is always the canonical way. Yeah. And it on its own is enough. Um, there is another um, basic problem here, which is uh, the notions of right and wrong that we have for representations, for sentences for us, they're being explained in terms of the biological functions of physical states. But when you think about it, 
there are lots of cases in which it might be biologically adaptive to get things wrong. I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I remember reading a report a while ago um, of um, studies of how popular people think they are, how popular other people think they are, and how happy the person is. Yeah? And um, uh, you, if, when you do that, you can measure the mismatch between how popular someone thinks they are and how popular their friends think they are. You see what I mean? Some people think they are very popular and their friends don't think they're popular at all. Some people um, think they're not popular and their friends think they're very popular. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. So you can measure the mismatch here between what you think of your own popularity and what your friends think of you. And the basic finding was that happiness is correlated with there being a mismatch between what you think of your own popularity and what you think of your friends, or of what your friends think of your popularity. You see what I mean? And um, that makes perfect sense, right? Um, it's adapt it could be adaptive to make, make a mistake like that. Um, I mean, in general, it could obviously be adaptive to be incorrigibly optimistic and think that the future is brighter than it is. As someone told me a while ago about an experiment where they had people um, play a computer game. And so there's a lot of stuff going on in the screen. And you've got a joystick, and you can ha make some input into what's going on in the screen. And the experimenters set it up so you could vary how much control the subject had over what was going on in the screen. Um, so sometimes the subject got very little control, and all that stuff just happening more or less at random. Sometimes the subject's entirely in charge of what is happening in the screen. And you, the subject is asked to estimate uh, uh, how much control they think they had in their test session. And there were two po things about this. One was that everyone wildly exaggerated how much control they had. Everyone reliably overestimated how much control they had. And you can imagine that, right? You're moving the joystick. You're watching the stuff on the screen, and you're thinking, hey, I made that happen. I made that happen. Um, there was only one group of subjects who reliably got it right about their exact level of control. Can you guess what group that might be? Sorry? The depressed, that's right. The clinically depressed reliably got it right about what level of control they had over what was going on in the screen. So. The, the general point here is that it might be adaptive not to be depressed, if you see what I mean. Um, the, 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 yeah, this rep was reported in a write-up called Sad But Wise. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, you can see how it might well be adaptive to get it wrong about how much control you have over, over, over what's going on around you. You will try harder if you, if you think you've got a lot of control. Um, you may do better. So there's a normativity of biological good functioning. That's normative, all right. There's something evaluative there. But it might not have much to do with the normativity of truth and falsity. Um, Fodor makes this point like this in the thing we're going to look at next. Um, why should we think of the mechanisms of belief fixation and what's ever causing your system S to go into its state as always designed so as to deliver truths rather than e.g. repressing unpleasant facts. Um, I mean, if there's no oxygen-free water for miles, it might still help a, magnetis uh, a bacterium if its magnetosome occasionally falsely indicates the presence of oxygen-free water, right? Because then it will keep trying. Yeah, not, well, you see what I mean. <laughs> right. um, and certainly something like that might be true for us. There is no guarantee that the kind of optimality that teleology reconstructs has much to do with the kind of optimality that the explication of truth requires. Yeah. So biological functions are normative notion, all right, but it's not obviously the same normative notion as truth or falsity. What's adaptive is one thing, and what's right or wrong is another. So the adaptive value of a representational system might actually just be in producing illusions. 
There is a final, really basic problem for this kind of approach to representation, which is the way that the notion of need is really basic to it. Um, the notion of need is what's anchoring the whole thing, right? Because we've got indication that doesn't of itself do the work. And then we've got function, which mustn't be just what someone intends or wants. It's got to be something about what this structure is doing for the organism, what the structure is getting the organism. But if your whole system of representation is defined entirely in relation to the needs of the animal, then all you can be representing are aspects of the world that relate to your needs. And Gibson, actually, the uh, great psychologist Gibson, seems to have thought that that's actually the right result. Uh, he talked about the affordances of an environment. And an affordance is just something about um, the threats and opportunities that the environment provides you with. So a coffee cup provides drinking. A computer provides typing. Um, a chair provides sitting. Yeah. All the threats and promises in the environment, the affordances of, a, of the environment are what it offers the animal what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill. And there's another classic definition of affordance from Mark. It's the fu an affordance is the functional utility of certain environmental objects or complexes taken with reference to individuals and their action capabilities. So the affordances for one species will be quite different to the affordances for another species. Oxygen-free water will afford continued life and sustenance, sustenance to the, um, to the bacterium. So what the bacterium is picking up on are the, is the affordances of the world around it. Right? In general, animals are very, very practical. They only care, they only represent what matters for them, for their needs and purposes. The trouble is that with humans, human re systems of representation seem to go way beyond just representing um, what's there for our needs and purposes. Of course we can do that. You can see that there's something there that affords eating and so on. But um, when humans are talking about what happened in the Big Bang or what is going on um, five miles below sea level, um, humans are not talking about anything that's defined in relation to their needs. That's a very narrow subset, actually, of what we do manage to think and talk about. We seem to think and talk about the way the world is objectively, the way the world is independent of our own um, needs. I once was um, visiting at a psychology department where they had a big car parking structure with... Um, on the side of the car parking structure, it was kind of honeycombed with big uh, cutouts, if you see what I mean. Big cutouts uh, like this in the side of the car parking structure. And when the structure was built, people just viewed it as yet another horrible concrete thing. And um, what nobody had expected was that pigeons locally would find this just a wonderful spot for nesting. Um, so they were all occupied by pigeons nesting. So there were affordances there that the pigeons could, use, could perceive. They afforded nesting for the pigeons. What humans get is not just, I mean, if we only got, if we could only represent the things in our environment that were of some use to us, that offered opportunities or threats to us, we wouldn't be able to see what the pigeons saw in this. Do you see what I mean? Oh, they would see their nesting potential. We would see our car parking potential, um, but that would be it. And all, our, our, our representation should just be blind to what the pigeons see. And as we say to the pigeons, I don't see what you see in that structure. Um, yeah, because if we're only getting things in relate, defined in relation to our needs and they get in relation to their needs, but that's not what goes on. If you just think about that very simple case, we can represent what's objectively going on, the shape of the thing, independent of our needs or the pigeon's needs, we can get something more fundamental, the way the world is in itself, and then we can think about how different sets of needs might exploit that aspect of the objective world. So we seem to transcend in our system of representation anything like 
this kind of uh, uh, tie always being back to stuff defined in terms of our needs. Okay, on with Fodor on um, Wednesday.